Well, let's see. I'll start you with the sign up sheet. And
is, is the average power that's um, going in through this current apart from the inefficiencies of the device. And, um, but the numbers of photons uh, uh, are distributed and in what, what you have in a coherent state is it's a linear combination of a large number of quantum states, in fact an infinite number of quantum states, that all conspire to produce a classical wave. So there's a kind of complementarity going on here, namely that um, knowing how many photons you have in a particular state is, or having a precise number in a quantum state means that the thing is, it's very quantum and it's very far different from the classical electromagnetic waves that we normally talk about and um, that are generated, for example, in this device or, in fact, in these lasers. These lasers are also generating um, you know, 10 to the 20th, 10 to the 30th photons, but in, um, in a, uh, a coherent, in a state that's essentially a coherent state. And so, in other words, these wave properties of, um, of the wave that's generated, that, that wave is, um, is the, in, in this case it's three centimeters, over there it's perhaps 400 nanometers, something like that. Um, and uh, that wave is a collective effect due to many photons. It's not the wave function that tells an individual photon where to go. So there are two very different ways. All right, are there any questions? Um, I, I wrote the exam, uh, the quiz on the lectures um, over the past, over the weekend and early this week. And it was put up on the website, I think Tuesday or Wednesday. And um, so it's worth 30% of your grade. Um, and uh, uh, you can have as many tries and so forth. And, uh, but please finish it for the deadline for all of the quizzes is uh, the date of the final exam, which is something handed down as an edict by the registrar. And um, so you just look that up, and uh, that's the date. I will also look it up, and I'll post it on the class webpage. You know, if you guys would all sit together in the front, it'd be a lot easier to sign in. Um, all right, now, so any questions about Waves, wave functions, and states, and the What is the final exam? When is the what? The final exam. There is no actual final exam, but the registrar has scheduled it on the date. Uh, a date that's been public, you know, for probably years. Um, it's on the UNM web page. I haven't looked it up. So I don't know when it is. It's sometime next. It's not next week. We have class next week, right? It's uh, the week after next. But uh, I don't know what day it is. I would guess it's Tuesday or Thursday, but I'm not even sure of that. Okay. But that's the deadline because um, the people who do set dates give me 48 hours to turn in the grades. Also, the bean counters like students to go to the web page and rate the course. They like them to they like you to rate all your courses. Um, I don't know where that web page is, but um, I, think I, it's I, should, a, I think it's on Learn. Well, yeah, I'm sure it's online somewhere. <laughs> but um, anyway, if, if tell you what, 
If you send me a link, I'll put it on the class web page. Okay, okay, sounds good. Okay, so, um, let's see, I have to give... Well, you know what, I, I, I pay for questions about physics, but not questions about when the exams are. I'm really not interested in teaching you about grading. This is a course on physics. So if you have questions about physics, ask them, and I'll th or math, and I'll throw you a candy. Yeah. It's on Thursday, May 11th. Oh, there we go. Thursday the 11th yeah. of May. Yeah, that's when okay. our test is supposed to be. All right, so let's say Thursday the 11th is um, the, uh, here, I guess you deserve a candy, even though it's about an exam. Um, yeah. Is there any reason in the uh, demo why the, the plastic or that glass is green instead of uh, just normal? Why it's green? Yeah, or like tinted. Oh, I don't know. I think they just had a piece of plastic and it happened to be uh, have a funny shape like that. And, um, good catch. Um, all right, so maybe I should turn out the lights and do some of these demos. Um, okay. Um, so what this, I think I've actually done these demos before in this course, but I just thought I'd show you them again, although maybe before showing you them, um, I should maybe do a diagram and explain a little bit what's happening. Um, so if you have uh, an electromagnetic wave, say, that is in a dense medium, say water, Glass, plastic, and uh, it's just going up, and it just continues on up straight. If, on the other hand, it's coming up at some angle like this, then when the wave hits here, the, let's suppose the wave, the wave front looks like that, then. As it gets here, the part of the wave that's in the air has been moving faster, and so it looks like that. The result is that the wave goes out like that. So in other words, the wave curves that way. So the example I gave was that if this is the edge of a swimming pool and somebody is standing here looking, the... Um, if there's a uh, treasure at the bottom of the swimming pool, the light from the treasure will go up and go off there, and the guy will think that the treasure is way out here. And um, anyway, so um, so that's what happens with that angle. But as you get the angle uh, closer to being parallel, then the wave starts going almost uh, just skimming the surface. And then at a certain point, the wave doesn't go out at all. It just goes back into the water. Um, the limiting case is when it comes up and the wave just goes, um, just shoots along the water and uh, just a fraction of a degree higher, and then you have total uh, internal reflection. I don't really spell that very well, so one of those spellings is right. <coughs> All 
Okay, so we have two examples of that. One is a fiber optic cable and I
and for a while that their trade would um, hit the exchange ahead of everybody else and uh, it was apparently worth uh, more than what it cost to um, put together the uh, the uh, their private microwave link, which is a thousand miles, after all, from New York to uh, Chicago. Um, since we've got the lights dim, I guess I might as well go to the next demo. Um, it's, fun, it's funny, this demo, which is a telescope demo, doesn't work at all with the lights dimmed, but this one does work better. Um, And so what do we have uh, here? What we have here is a converging lens. And, um, and then what I could do is hook up a diverging lens here. Um, let's see, where does it go? It goes like this. So what we see here is, it's once again the same business of the difference between light in a, um, light in air and then light in something with which the light interacts. So the light, the photons scatter off the atoms in the plastic or the water and um, in effect they slow down and so the wave slows down and the direction changes. And in this way, um, if this thing was set up perfectly, all these things, all these light beams would, would go to uh, what's called the focus. Um, and so the, I have, these things are parallel here because light from infinity um, goes in, um, The, 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 in other words, an object will re emit light, say, in all directions. But if the object is very far away, then the beams that are reaching us are essentially parallel. And um, so a, B, a convex lens will then focus that to some point. And if you put a concave lens beyond it, then what happens is the um, before these converging lines um, meet at the point, the convex lens makes them diverge. Maybe I should put this one forward and see if, see if I can get it to... Anyway, um, the principle of the Galilean telescope is you have a convex lens focusing and then a convex, a convex lens focusing, a concave lens then diverging, and you put your eye back here, and what your eye sees is um, the light diverging from what looks like a, a closer point. And if one does all the ray diagrams, uh, one sees that, in fact, it's, um, it's uh, effectively a telescope. The object is magnified and um, right side up, and it looks closer. So we've actually got that here. Um, this is the convex lens. Uh, this is a concave lens. And um, so looking through it, what, we, what, what you see is that, um, let's see, can I get, I'm just wondering, and I guess I shouldn't try to screw it up. Um, 
But what you're seeing there is an image is um, this thing that's taped to the wall. And um, if I just put, say, two fingers here, um, you can see that the image, in effect, of the two fingers is bigger than it would be if you were just looking at it with, um, without any magnification. Um, Galileo made something like this, um, and it was the first telescope, at least in the Western world. And um, it, uh, he was able to see uh, craters on the moon. And when he saw those craters on the moon, he realized that what he probably suspected already was that this idea of a perfect heaven was just sort of nonsense. It was simple and silly. And uh, he also was able to see not only Jupiter, but four of Jupiter's moons. Um, he was also able to see Saturn, but uh, his, and he was able to see the rings, but what it looked, his telescope wasn't good enough to really tell that they were rings. Instead, it looked as though Saturn had two moons that were, that were um, on either side. In other words, the, the rings came out to be moons. Remember, last time I was talking, or a week ago, I was talking about Enceladus, which is one of the moons of Saturn. And it's basically a watery moon covered by a shell of ice. And, um, well, I say watery, it's liquid, but I think it is water, uh, a lot of it. Anyway, <clears throat> there's um, that moon, it, you'd think it'd be frozen solid, but because it's in a funny elliptical orbit around Saturn, um, and then Saturn has various big moons, the varying gravitational stresses heat the planet up, and so the water is um, melted and it's, the water is liquid. And it's conceivable that life has originated there. The problem, though, is that there's very little ultraviolet light there, so it's hard to see how um, various chemical bonds could have been broken and then restart and reformed into, uh, or how molecules could be helped over potential bumps to form um, needed combinations. Um, but, on the other hand, the universe is a very radioactive place, and so there are cosmic rays coming in from uh, all directions, and many of these cosmic rays are a lot stronger than ultraviolet radiation, and they go just um, right uh, through the shell, right through the ice, right through the water. Um, so, uh, the possibility of there being enough radiation to get things going is uh, is a real possibility. Yeah? I had a question about the fiber what? optics. I had a question about the fiber optics. Yeah. So the traders on Wall Street yeah. would make their own line. Wouldn't yeah. it make more sense to make a straight tunnel that a beam of light could go they, Yeah, they made the tunnels as straight as possible. Because I was thinking with the fiber optic, the light bounces inside it, right? Right. Well, yeah, but they, so by having the tunnel straight, they, um, they were able to have the fiber optic cable, you know, they made it as close to a straight line as possible between New York and, and, and Chicago. But of course, that's a thousand miles, which is like 1 24th of the circumference of the Earth. And so consequently, there was a certain bending due to the curvature of the Earth. They didn't cope with that. Um, I think I learned about this in the book by Michael Lewis, who uh, has written several books about finance, and um, I don't know if he's the best writer about finance, but he's one of the most entertaining, possibly the most entertaining, and in fact, the movie The Big Short was based on his book, which is of the same name, and uh, The Big Short is, I think, one of the best movies ever made. It's um, very educational and it's a great bit of fun to watch. Um, although it treats, of course, this terrible uh, financial uh, crisis of uh, 07, 08, 09. Um, 
Okay, so let's see where we are in um, these demos. Well, we've got um, another demo here. This is similar to, this is the same apparatus basically as the one that I did, that I showed you um, two days ago. Uh, this is a generator and it generates essentially a coherent state of three microwave uh, photons. And um, this is a this is a receiver, and this is just a speaker. And it takes a while for this thing to warm up. Starting to warm up now, and they're also volume. Okay, so the signal's coming through. Now, how is it coming through? Well, it's coming through directly because it um, comes out here, hits the plastic in a perpendicular way, it goes through. But there are two pieces of plastic here. Now, if I start to move. This, these are two triangles. Triangle, another triangle, just the same. Now, if they're far enough apart, then what happens is this wave is totally internally reflected. Pretty much, it's not perfect by any means. Um, but on the other hand, as I move this closer, uh, it now behaves, now the, because the waves are three centimeters, they don't notice that there's a, you know, a tenth of a millimeter air gap there. And so they just go straight through as if it were a solid block of plastic. And then we can see what the, what actually happens, remember I was talking about the, um, case where the wave sort of skims along the surface and people call this an evanescent wave and um, so that wave just sort of skims along here and this other block can pick it up if it's close enough so as I get closer the signal picks up but when I'm much farther away than, than well, it's about a centimeter. It picks it up at about a centimeter, but longer than that, it uh, doesn't uh, work very well. Uh, all right. I... Okay. All right, so let's see. I've done all the demos except one, but this other demo is what happens when I try to do this other demo. I don't know if it's going to be at all clear. The nice thing about it is that, well, the, the, the thing that's not so nice about it is that this thing is very low power and puts out a very weak signal. Um, so let me turn all the lights out. Okay, well, well, this kind of works. You see here we have a convex lens. The light beams are coming in, they're sort of parallel, and it brings them to a focus. All right. Now, in this Galilean telescope, what you do is you put a diverging lens. 
I don't know quite where to put it. That's, that's working right there. It's just really hard to see the... All right, the let's, let's go with that then. What you can... If this were brighter, we could... Maybe there's dust here. Hold on. Actually, up a little bit. So, um, the idea is that the light from infinity comes in and gets focused to a point, but this diverging convex lens brings it out. And so now, to an eye over here, it looks as though the light's coming from some point here rather than from infinity, and so the object functions, the device functions as a telescope. Anyway, the... <coughs> The uh, remarkable thing is that what Galileo did was he figured that out and then built the thing and indeed it worked. This was at a time, I'm no historian, okay, so. <laughs> but um, this was at a time when um, people, I think mainly in Holland, were developing lenses and um, I'm not sure whether they were developing them mainly for eyeglasses or whether they were developing them to make... They were known for their optics. They, yeah. I, uh, there was a right. certain kind of practice but that they did had. They make, did they make something like binoculars before Galileo's telescope? I forget his last name, but his first name was Johannes, and he was a... I know he was a physicist. His name was what? Johannes something. Kepler? Um, uh, I don't think it, it might have been Kepler. It was Yo sure. Johannes Kepler. In, well, both Newton and Kepler improved upon uh, Galileo's telescope. And uh, then, of course, as technology advanced and people started making eyeglasses, binoculars, and this was a big deal back then because, of course, um, Holland, Spain, Portugal, Italy, France, England were all trading, and they'd send out a ship, and um, they'd take um, British manufactured goods to India, buy opium, sell it in China, buy tea, bring it back to India. They had a triangular trade like that, which did a lot of damage to, um, to China. And, um, Uh, anyway, they, they made a lot of money, and in particular there was a Dutch East India trading company, and they were, um, for a while, they controlled the oceans for a certain period of time, and um, they basically behaved as pirates. <laughs> if there were any other, <laughs> any other trading vessel there, they would uh, sink it or take the goods and so forth. So they were, they played rough in those days. Okay. Um, okay um, all right, I guess, all right, I guess I've, I've finished with the demo, mm -hmm. so I'm going to, I guess, talk about um, physics and uh, other things. Oh, there is one other link I put up on the website. So let me take, um, Turn the lights down again. Well, first let me see if I can get the image here. Oh gosh, it's password protected. Ah, it worked. Um, okay. <laughs> That's why I usually don't Okay, so this is the class web page, and. Um, Oh, sorry about that. Internet address up here stuff in the corner. Um, the new website that I added <laughs> was this one, which is um, images, various images of the Crab Nebula, which is, um, let's see. All right, I guess that's about as big as it gets. Um, so let me turn the lights out so you can get a nicer view of this.
So um, what we're seeing here is six images of the Grand Nebula. Now, um, a nebula, or at least this nebula, is the remnants of a supernova explosion. And this is a supernova that was observed by Chinese astronomers in about 1050. Um, the web page gives the exact date, but um, we're now on a different. We're now following the link, so I don't see it. 1050, 1051, 1054, something like that. The Chinese astronomers saw the <clears throat> saw the supernova, which um, I guess was close enough so that I think it could even be seen in the day. It was so bright. Um, anyway, what we're seeing here is. The uh, what the nebula, of course, the one all right, so the supernova is where the plus is, that's where the where the um, at least I think that's where the original star was, and there may even be a remnant uh, there. Uh, but that was, of course, an enormous explosion which then blew a lot of material out into space. Most of the contents of the star were then blown out into space, and the star. In order to be a supernova, it had to be heavier than the sun. And um, it, uh, and so, and, and during the supernova explosion, all the heavier elements, heavier than iron, are made. Um, and all this material is blasted out into space, and then it can condense and form planets and stars later on. But again, this is fairly recent. This, the light reached Earth. Um, nearly a thousand years ago, and uh, the light probably was traveling through space for a hundred or a thousand or a million years before it reached the Earth. Anyway, all that hot uh, matter that was blown out into space uh, had been radiating ever since. And uh, in the radio, in the infrared, in the visible, in the ultraviolet, in the X-ray, and in high energy x-ray. So here is an image of the uh, Crab Nebula, the remnant of the supernova, uh, as seen by the VLA, which is the very large array, it's a radio telescope, which is down in Socorro, uh, New Mexico, about 60 miles or so south of here. So that radio, uh, that's an array of radio telescopes. And by having many of them far apart, they can um, get, uh, they can resolve uh, the, an image even though the wavelength of the light or the electromagnetic waves are radio waves, so, so they are um, uh, meters long or tens of meters. Anyway, then there's another telescope called the Spitzer named after an astronomer, and, um, yeah, these are, anyway, th this uh, is then infrared radiation. So this is um, radiation that's, um, uh, instead of being, uh, well, radiation of about a micron, two microns, <coughs> or more. And uh, one of the nice things about radio and infrared radiation is that it tends to travel long distances through the universe without being stopped by dust. Then we've got visible, a visible image of the Crab Nebula in the Hubble, the Hubble Space Telescope. And now here, some telescope called Astro-1, I don't know what that is, uh, it's imaging the same nebula but in the ultraviolet. And um, so what we see here then is presumably the, this part is hotter, but I, I don't know what the color coding is. The astronomers use false colors to code their images um, and to make them more attractive. And um, if they don't include the color code, you can't really tell whether the blue part is hotter or colder. Here's one in low energy. So the, the UV, of course, is wavelengths shorter than about 300 microns, and energies of 5, 10 electron volts per photon. 
And uh, here's low energy X-ray, so that would be 100 electron volts or 1,000 electron volts. High energy, well, it's hard to say what that means. It could be um, 1,000 electron volts, even a million electron volts. Well, all that's getting into what, what we call gamma rays. Um, anyway, uh, these are our uh, six different images of the same object. And um, I think we can infer from this that the center is the hotter part because you see uh, the high energy X-rays and the low energy X-rays are coming from the center of the nebula. So the color coding must be that orange is hot and so the hot part is the part that's still inside. Of course, that makes sense because um, you've got basically a sphere of hot gas or plasma and um, the part that's inside is getting radiation from the rest of the plasma, whereas the part that's way out here on the outside is exposed to the cold of space and it's not getting any heating from, it's only getting heating from one side, so it would cool off. So I guess that's the picture of the thing. Um, uh, so I'll turn the lights on and maybe we can talk about some um, other in particular, are there any questions? I was going to ask about the, I think you answered the question, um, why we send, oh, thank you, why we send certain wavelengths up rather than just one particular length. What's the benefit over radio waves, over visible light? Oh, well, well, the over, point is you get, light. you see, what you get is you get different information and you get a different image mm -hmm. from different um, uh, wavelengths. Okay, yeah, you can so, see that, so, too. So the point is, you, you, I mean, it's, you know, we have eyes that can see a whole range of colors, a range of about a factor of two, okay. from um, long wavelength red to short wavelength blue. Mm -hmm. And, you know, don't you like seeing it? Yeah, 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 it's pretty you good. You get more <laughs> attention, right? So, and, um, in fact, we probably evolved color in order to tell where the fruit was ripe in the trees. Um, mm -hmm. I, that's a guess. Um, it would be nice if we started out with color, but what? it would be nice if we started out with color, or, but that's you know, debatable. Well, I mean, you know, everything was evolved. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, the... Um, so the, the point is that uh, when you try to observe things, you try to observe them as completely as possible, and so you get different information from x-rays uh, and from radio waves. Um, and then, you know, it's just that some objects are bright in x-rays and not in radio. Others are bright in radio and not in x-rays, and we saw that in these images. Um, for example, the um, the nebula is bright only at its center in high energy X-rays, whereas in radio waves, the whole nebula has a certain brightness. Okay. Um, do you think that has something to do with what they're in, like? Obviously, it has something to do with what they're emitting, but you the can the temperature, mm -hmm. what they're made of, how fast they're moving. Okay. Whether they're charged, whether the particles are charged or neutral. Okay. All these things play a role. In particular, if you have charged particles moving, then there's a good chance you're going to get a, a radio signal. Okay. And in fact, an ordinary radio antenna is just electrons moving up and down in an okay. antenna. Okay. Okay. Um, so let's see. We, I think we've talked about um, a lot of topics, but I think in the last few lectures, maybe I'll say something more about maybe chemistry and biology? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, no? Have you, ever, uh, have you ever seen people who stunt motorcycles? Have I ever seen people on motorcycles? Who stunt them. Huh? Who stunt them, like do wheelies? And well, like, yeah, all right. <laughs> but, um, I mean, I've seen it occasionally, but it's not something that interests me. Um, but the physics of it doesn't interest you? 
But I, um, I mean, I think it's dangerous and noisy and flutes the air. On the other hand, I have to admit that motorcycles probably admit less pollution than cars. Yo. Uh, do you know anything about Heisenberg and how he kept his research from the Nazis in that area? We're talking about Werner Heisenberg? Yeah, the, the one who made uncertainty. uncertainty well, as I told you, I once met Heisenberg um, in Berkeley about sometime back in the 70s. Um, but I didn't talk with him very much. I just basically said hello, pleased to meet you, shook his hand, and um, let him speak with the person who had invited him. Um, I don't know much about what his thought processes were. I do know that he was, um, that he liked to hike and that he would um, go on hikes by himself or with other physicists or, or students or friends or whatever. And um, that's something that, um, that I recommend to you all because uh, it's in New Mexico, we have these hiking trails all around the city and they're not far away. And so it's, um, it's, a, uh, it's a very healthy thing to go hiking. And uh, it's possible that, that his um, brain was more oxygenated than that of most other people because of his um, heights. But, you know, what act, how he put two and two together and got a thousand, I don't know. Did, did he was, uh, I think he was asking if you knew anything about how Heisenberg uh, kept secrets from the Nazis. Oh, that? Is that what you said? Yeah. All right, no, I, I don't know much about that, no. Um, let, let me throw you a candy because I didn't... Well, a little short there. Uh, I don't know. I think Heisenberg's attitude was that uh, an atomic bomb was not practical. Um, uh, for Germany under war conditions in a rush and so on. Um, I don't know. Um, there, some people say that Werner von Braun, who was the head of the rocket uh, division of Nazi Germany, um, and was shooting off rockets that would then land in England, that von Braun had Von Braun actually realized that what he was doing was totally pointless from a military perspective because he was using up enormous German resources and just occasionally, you know, kill some Englishmen um, milking cows somewhere. In it just, there was England. no end game. And there was not a great deal of, um, um, I mean, I think he could aim them better than that, but uh, it's still the, the, the amount of damage done was very small um, for all the effort. And some people even said that uh, he was trying to end the war, but <laughs> that he, or he was on the side of the Allies. I don't know. It, it, that sounds kind of far, far stretched. Um, but who knows? I, um, I, I suspect he was taking advantage of Hitler. Okay. He could talk Hitler into letting him learn about rockets, and uh, so he... Did. From what I understand, he was a lot less politically motivated than the rest of the people, or the rest of his colleagues. Less political, people. Yeah. Yes, yes. I once actually saw him. I was at, um, some, in some NASA program, and um, I was a college student at the time, and we were all in some room, and it was well It was in Florida or Alabama or something. It was hot humid summer, but they had a lot of air conditioning, and somebody was giving a talk and he fell asleep. So that's, that's all I'm sure. Um, so anyway, do you want to hear more about physics, or should I veer into... I was going to mention, because we were talking about rockets, and then you mentioned chemistry and biology before that. Um, yeah. Because I'm, I'm kind of interested in that. But in I, which? Um, just 
propulsion rockets in general? Yeah, um, yeah. Well, the people who are doing the best job now are probably the te the um, the Tesla people or mm -hmm. the SpaceX people, the um, Elon Musk and, and company. I think Musk actually uh, has a degree in physics. I think he has it in business and something else. I forget what. I think he was an undergraduate in physics. Yeah, he was a, he went to Stanford for a little bit, but I know he dropped out at a certain point. Well, anyway, I, I don't know the details. What he what he has done, of course, is what you have with a with a rocket is um, the original rockets were just one stage, and so you had a lot of fuel and a big container and the the fuel would burn and the molecules uh, or, or uh, would hit the inside of the rocket and push it upward and then the other ones, the ones that were going down would just go out the back end to go down. That's one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is just conservation of momentum. If you've got a lot of gas going down, the rocket has to go up. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, it was one stage. Mm -hmm. But um, that is very expensive because you have to accelerate the whole first stage up into the up into space. So they then developed ones that were a large first stage, a smaller intermediate stage, and then a smaller payoff. And um, so that's how the moon rockets were. And what NASA would do, it, it just it had the launch pad in Florida, and so the rocket would go up and go off, would veer off toward, it would of course, um, always go east and on, uh, onto the Atlantic, over the Atlantic Ocean. And um, the reason for launching it east is, first of all, then the first stage would fall into the ocean rather than on Texas, say. And the complaints are on Texas. <laughs> the, but the other reason is that the Earth is rotating, and the surface of the Earth at the equator is rotating at about 1,000 miles an hour. Um, because it's the, di the circumference is 24,000 miles and it rotates in 24 hours. So the surface of the equator is moving eastward at a, a speed relative to the center of the Earth of mm -hmm. about 1,000 miles an hour. So um, one launches rockets going east, and in fact, the best place to launch them is on the equator. Okay. So uh, Cape Canaveral is as close as we could get to the equator without. Um, leaving the U.S. And um, on the other hand, the French have an island, French Guiana, that perhaps is even on the equator, or very close to it. And uh, so they, they launch rockets from there. Okay. And I imagine the Indians have something on the equator. That's true. Uh, or, clo or a lot closer than yeah, anyone else. Yeah. And certainly there's a part of <coughs> Africa that are on the equator. Um, anyway. So uh, what Tesla has done what is um, arranged for the first st stage, which is very heavy, to be computer controlled. So that when it runs out of fuel, it releases the satellite. And then instead of just crashing into the ocean, it um, comes back down and uh, retains enough fuel so as to land gently mm -hmm. on a boat somewhere out in the ocean on a ship in the ocean. Yeah. And um, I think they've been successful in something like four out of five times or something like they that. They did screw up once. And they're the presumably other. getting better at it. And um, the result is then they, they can reuse the first stage. And in fact, they think that shortly they'll be able to send, send, use the first stage, send a satellite or something else up, bring it back down, land it, refurbish it, refuel it, and send it up again a week later. Okay. So, um, so they've made an enormous amount of progress and cut enormously the cost of sending things into space. Mm -hmm. Some of the things they send into space are food and water and so forth for the guys that are on the International Space Station, which, by the way, is... 99, 98% of a waste of money. Is, oh, okay. yeah. Well, my view is that the whole manned space program is vastly premature. 
But just because it's a manned space flight. It's enormously expensive to send people into space, and people are fragile, and it's dangerous to put people in space because of all the radiation, cosmic rays, and um, you don't learn very much. Um, and, you know, these modern, ex modern experiments are, mean that you have a detector out there that is trying to pick up a signal that no one's ever seen. Well, then it has to count photons or whatever it's counting for a long time, hours, weeks, or something. And you can't expect an astronaut to sit up there for that length of time. And even if he did, the warmth of his body would disturb the, um, the, uh, the imaging device on the telescope. Um, so it's, it's all together a, a pretty silly idea. And the other thing is you send people up there, you contaminate the environment. That's One of the big questions is does life evolve um, you know, easily or very hard, with great, you know, very seldom. So you want to see if there's life on Mars. Well, you don't send a person up there who's, you know, shedding viruses and bacteria, germs, mm -hmm. not to mention excrement or spit or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, sneezing. Um, well, of course, they're in sort of a spacesuit of some kind. You that can, hair could fall you can, you can protect the planet to some extent, but you're just asking for contamination by sending up people. Whereas you can send up robot, well, the rover has been moving around for three years using solar power. Mm -hmm. And it can um, dig and uh, test the soil and you send up a better one and it's much cheaper than sending people and the, the rover can stay there for years whereas a person, I think, on the surface of Mars would... Two weeks years, before they said, uh, nope. <laughs> Would, would be a serious problem. Okay. I mean, that's, that's, they mentioned that in the video about Cassini, um, that that's a huge problem that like uh, the geysers that would form because of the water underneath the ice, like that body of water, they detected microbes in the water that came out from, and then Cassini got that. This? What? Um, in the in the video you posted on the class website that's talking about oh oh that was Enceladus so, yeah and so when yeah they, were they didn't the actually cell. detect bacteria they detected I think hydrogen okay and was... some other chemicals through the plume yeah I was going to mention that again today because um, it turns out that the 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 water vapor and other vapors coming out of the cracks in Enceladus that moon on the funny orbit mm -hmm. around Saturn. Are act have actually formed one of Saturn's rings. Really? Yeah, okay. probably one of the smaller rings. And uh, in fact, in the, just today, the Cassini telescope dove through. Uh, it's it's. I guess it's now. I think it is now between Saturn and all of the rings. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's going to be doing that for. A while, I don't know, I guess a couple of months and then it's going to crash into the surface. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's on Facebook that in September it's supposed to land. September? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and they designed it to be a, a fiery re-entry on purpose so as not to contaminate Saturn okay. with uh, the pugs that it happens to be carrying, even though probably they sent it up fairly clean, but mm -hmm. still, you know, you can't. The rest of space, you've got to account for it. I mean, these microbes are so small. You, and in fact, th this reminds me of something else that we were talking about a while ago. I was talking about um, how, you know, if something falls out of a plane due to air resistance, there's a certain terminal velocity. And for people falling out of planes, it's like 200 miles an hour or something. Um, but for smaller objects, it's slower, and uh, mice might even survive. Insects obviously survive. And of course, molecules, uh, virus particles survive, they just sort of float along. And that's why some diseases are, in fact, the flu is really dangerous because it, um, the virus particles can just float in the air and 
one guy sneezes and you know, somebody 10 feet away can catch the virus, enough virus particles to become infected. And back in 1918, there was a flu that occurred during the First World War and it killed 50 million people. And uh, in fact, it, uh, it killed more people than were killed in the war. Um, yeah, but this was all over because it went all over the planet. Um, it's called the Spanish flu, but it's only, it didn't start in Spain. It's just called the Spanish flu because Spain wasn't in the war, so they didn't have censorship. And they said, we've got this terrible flu. Okay. And whereas Germany and France and England and the U.S. were all at war, so they pretended that nobody was sick. Because you never hear, I mean, I've heard so, of the Spanish yeah. flu before, but In fact, that's... some people think that the flu started at an army base in the Midwest. Oh. Um, but I, I don't know if that's true. So, do you, you don't want to hear more about rockets, do you? I mean, I, I kind of do, but... <laughs> I was once down there in Cape Canaveral and, okay. uh, and had a tour of the place uh, many years ago, back in the 60s. Mm. And but I don't know, you know, they're huge objects. But <laughs> SpaceX is doing it in a much more cost-effective way. Okay. Uh, some people talk about mining asteroids, whether that's cost-effective, I don't know. But with the progress that SpaceX has made, it might conceive of a bit. Um, I guess a more interesting question would be, what, what do you think are some of the important either experiments or developments that are happening recently? In all of science? Or oh, yeah, I'm just in physics mainly. But. Well, what the main, in fundamental physics, the main experiment is, um, it's a series of experiments done in the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. And there, they're... Um, they, they got the accelerator working like a Swiss watch. Okay. It is Switzerland, after yeah. all. <laughs> and uh, they originally had it at seven trillion electron volts, mm -hmm. total energy. And now it's at a 13 going to 14 shortly. And um, because they are making progress with superconducting magnets, so they have a current flowing, they have superconducting metals at very low temperatures carry enormous currents, creating enormous magnetic fields that are able to bend the particles even though they're moving at uh, almost the speed of light and have an energy of seven trillion electron volts, which, you know, compared to an ordinary proton at rest, it's a, um, a billion electron volts. So that's an increase in mass by a factor of 7,000 due to uh, the, the, uh, the acceleration of special relativity. And uh, so they're colliding these, but so far this has only confirmed the standard model of particle physics and has uh, exhibited the Higgs boson. Mm -hmm. um, so they've discovered the Higgs and they're learning something about the Higgs boson. But um, it's... Uh, so, so the, those experiments are important. Um, other experiments that are important are more laboratory experiments on the electric dipole moment of the neutron and of the electron. So far, they only have upper limits, but these upper limits are ruling out certain theories or putting limits on certain theories. Okay, okay. All right, I think um, I, oh. class is dismissed. It's already um, at the end of the hour. Um, I, I, mean, I can just chat for a yeah. minute, uh, uh, the, although, you know, they have to set up the next uh, class, mm -hmm. the next demos. Uh, so there are experiments like that, and then, um, then there's a whole field of condensed matter, okay. biophysics. Oh, um, okay. That's true. Uh, and then, of course, the real funding these days goes into Biology and medicine. Bio, okay. Um, okay. And uh, so there's a there's a lot of progress being made there. Mm -hmm. And you, you you can see that it's made very obvious when you see some of the developments that people create, and at least in medicine. Yeah. Well, 
it's, 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 it would be a lot nicer if, um, well, I mean, the funding of science, frankly, 